confidence when interest rates are low than when they're high, and so consumers tend to spend more. And the final channel, something that is in our income expenditure model, is the exports one. Um, when interest rates fall, the dollar is likely to fall too, which makes U.S. goods look like a bargain to foreigners, and hence their exports um, are likely to rise. So there are a bunch of channels um, of varying strength and power and of uncertain strength of power, by which aggregate demand um, depends on the long-term risky real interest rate R. When the interest rate is lower, the economy is going to be at a point on the IS curve um, that heads down and to the right that has a high level of real GDP. When interest rates are higher, the economy is going to be on a point up and to the left um, on the IS curve at a lower level of real GDP. Um, now, where does this risky real long-term interest rate come from? Um, what determines it? It's set in financial markets. Right? That that's what financial markets are. A bunch of people buying and selling bonds and other securities for a price, and associated with each price for a bond is an interest rate. Um, and the Federal Reserve is in there intervening in financial markets every single day. The Federal Reserve buys and sells short-term government bonds for cash, and sometimes as now it does other things. Um, and by buying and selling short-term government bonds for cash, experience has taught us that the Federal Reserve can set the interest rate for short-term, safe, nominal government bonds. Um, call that I, um, whatever, wherever it wants. You know, the Federal Reserve can control this sucker, and it does. But this I um, isn't this R. Um, sh the interest rate on short-term, nominal, safe U.S. Treasury bonds, um, Treasury bills that are due three months from now, is different from the interest rate on long-term, risky, real bonds of one sort or another, the interest rate that a company would have to pay if it went out into the markets right now and said, we want to borrow a whole bunch of money in order to build a new factory. There's a lot of slippage um, between I and R. <coughs> and that slippage is financial economics. You take a financial economics course here, and you'll do nothing else but study the slippage between I and R. <laughs> but let's start with I. Uh, let's start with the Federal Reserve, um, the money stock, and interest rates. Um, and the way to think about it um, is that you want to have, everyone wants to have some liquid cash money um, in their pockets. Um, or not just liquid cash money. Um, money in your pockets, money in your checking account, um, unused balances on your credit card that you could actually use to boost, you know, um, that you could actually use to spend if you wanted to spend more. Um, desired money holdings um, are... And your desired money holdings, um, they're given by what economists call the quantity theory of money. Um, that given your spending level, the price level times the level of real GDP, um, you're going to want to hold enough money in your pockets and in your bank accounts so that when money moves at the velocity appropriate to current interest rates, you're happy. If you have more M than you want to have, if the right side of this equation is bigger than the left side, well, you'll then have too much cash in your pockets and you're going to want to try to dump some of it to use it to buy something else. Um, if you have too little money in your pockets, well, once again, you're going to try to build up your money balances. You're going to take one of your other assets and you're going to try to sell it in order to build up your money balances. Um, and there's a, um, a feedback effect. That when interest rates are higher, you want to spend your money faster. You don't want to have excess money when you could be making a bundle by holding your wealth in bonds. So whenever the Federal Reserve or the banking system expands M, um, does something to expand the money stock, people are then going to turn around and try to take some of their excess money and buy bonds with it instead. Um, when the Federal, Reserve, the Federal Reserve expands M, demand for bonds goes up. And increased demand for bonds is going to push up the price of bonds. You know, simple supply and demand. A lot more people say, we have extra cash, we'd rather have this cash in 10-year treasury bonds or three-month treasury bills. Um, let's go out and buy some. And here things get complex because the prices and the interest rates on bonds move in opposite directions. When the price goes up, the interest rate goes down. Um, when the price goes down, the interest rate goes up. The best way to, th to see this is to think about two different kinds of bonds. Um, on the one hand, a pure discount bond, um, like a treasury bill. Um, a treasury bill doesn't say on its front what its interest rate is. Um, a treasury bill is just a promise by the US government to pay the owner of it $1,000 three months from now. And whenever the treasury borrows money through treasury bills, what it does is it auctions off these treasury bills. Here they say, it's a promise from the US treasury to pay you $1,000 in cash three months from now. How much will you bid for this bond um, in cash right now? Um, and indeed, the treasury bond has a price when issued. Currently, the price is something like $999 for each $1,000 treasury bond, but it does have a price. Um, and then you can think, if I invest in treasury bonds, what's the interest rate um, I'm going to earn on my money? Well, and the answer is, well, you can calculate the interest rate off of the price um, of the treasury bond. Um, suppose you can buy a treasury bond right now for $999. Well, that means that you're going to get um, $1,000 for it in three months. 1,000 minus 999 is $1. Um, that means you get one over $999 um, in three months. That's your interest payment on your treasury bill. But that's for three months. We report interest rates in terms of percent per year. Um, so you get one 999th times four, because if you did this four times in a row, you get four times as much. So we have four over 0.999, um, which is about 0.4 over 100, um, which would mean that a treasury bond that's selling at 999 would be paying you an interest rate of four-tenths of 1% per year. Um, actually, today, I think it's more like four-hundredths of 1% per year. They're not selling for $999. They're selling for $999.90. That's how you calculate the interest rate on a pure discount bond. Um, that is one that gives you principal back, but that doesn't pay you any interest. In the meantime, um, you perform this calculation, you calculate the interest rate. As you can see, when P goes up, I goes down. Um, or take the opposite. Um, at the moment, the United States government doesn't issue any consolidated security loans. Consoles is what they're called, one of the first acronyms. The U.S. government doesn't issue any consolidated security loans. Um, Britain used to. Britain doesn't. Um, a console is a perpetual bond. Um, that is, it never expires. When the British government used to issue consoles, it would say, here is a promise from the King of England. Uh, the King of England will pay you, say, 40 pounds a year forever. Right, until the sun falls and beyond that. You know, as long as there's an England, as long as there's a king of England, um, he's going to pay you 40 pounds a year forever. How much will you bid for a, for a promise from the king of England to pay you 40 pounds forever? Um, when people would bid in the auction and it would have a price. Um, and what would the annual rate of return on, say, a 4% console with a face value of 1,000 pounds sterling be? Um, well, a 4% console with a face value of 1,000 pounds would carry an annual interest payment of 40 pounds with it. You'd simply take the 40 pounds, you'd divide it by the price. That would give you the long-term nominal interest rate on the console. And once again, when P goes up, um, because demand for bonds is higher, the interest rate on the bond, in this case IL, the long-term safe nominal interest rate, goes down.
In the real world, we don't have consoles, and we only have a few discount bonds, the treasury bills. Um, almost all the bonds out there that are sold are bonds that have a maturity, a date at which the government or whoever you lend the money to pays you back your principal. And in the meantime, in the meantime, carries periodic interest rates, usually every six months or so. Um, used to be that we actually had bearer bonds, um, things where you carried the bond around with you. And the bond would have a large 8.5 by 11 thing with fancy engraving to prevent counterfeiting, saying it was a bond. And at the bottom of it, there would be little coupons, you know, the kind of tear-off coupons that you see on the signs where, you know, dog walking or homework help call, you know, 643-2152 or whatever, with little tear-off things at the bottom so you can tear one up and take with you. Um, except these bonds, um, the numbers are rather larger. Outside the Secretary of the Treasury's dining room, they used to have framed some copies of, I think, a $50 million bond from 1971, which still had some of its coupons attached. For some reason, I don't understand. Um, there'd be this thing that said face value of $50 million. Um, and then because it was a 6% bond, um, its annual coupons, annual coupon payments were $3 million, um, which meant every six months payment was $1.5 million. And so there'd be this little thing at the bottom, you know, about two inches by one inch, which would say pay to the bearer upon receipt $1.5 million. Um, and when people walked up to this and took a look at it, you could sometimes see them thinking, um, if I broke a glass and grabbed one of these things, could I then get $1.5 million um, down to the treasury cash room? Um, the answer, no, you couldn't. Um, the bonds now have to be registered to their registered owners. The treasury won't pay you unless you're the properly registered owner. And anyway, the cash room is now closed. Um, but in the old days, um, you used to show up and tear off your coupon and hand it over. They'd hand back the money, which is why that if you hear people talk about bonds, you'll find that the every six-month interest payment that you get on one is still often called the coupon payment. <coughs> as if it's a $5 off coupon from CVS, uh, in this case, a $1.5 million um, coupon for the U.S. Treasury from the early 1970s. Um, Though nowadays everything is done by electronic funds transfer, if only because that creates an electronic trail and it's easy to unwind if something goes wrong. Um, so that's the brief excursion into financial um, economics, um, what a bond is. Um, and now we can see how the Federal Reserve controls interest rates. Um, you know, suppose it buys bonds for cash. All of a sudden people out there have more cash, and they probably have more cash than they want, so they're going to want to dump some of their cash and buy bonds with it. On the other hand, the Federal Reserve has just bought up a bunch of bonds. So the Federal Reserve has decreased the supply of bonds as well. Um, decreased supply of bonds and increased demand for bonds means the prices of bonds rise. Um, and rising bond prices mean falling interest rates. And interest rates keep on falling until people are happy holding the newly enlarged quantity of money in the system. Um, interest rates keep falling until interest rates have fallen sufficiently low that people's desire to spend the money in their pockets quickly has fallen off. People are no longer saying, gee, this money in my pocket, I should spend it quickly or else invest it, I'm losing interest. People say instead, meh, um, the interest rate's so low that I really don't care that I have extra cash in my pockets, I'm happy, I'm holding it there. When that happens, the interest rate settles at its new level, appropriate to the newly enlarged quantity of money in the system. Um, okay, so how much of that has sunk in? Uh, when the supply of money goes up and the supply of bonds go down, as a result of expansionary open market operations, of purchases of bonds for cash from the Federal Reserve, what's going to happen um, to the price of bonds when the supply of money goes up and the supply of bonds goes down? Okay, you're right. Yep, the supply of... Price of bonds goes up. Um, a higher supply of money means a greater demand for bonds. A lower supply of bonds means less supply of bonds. More demand, less supply means the price goes up. Um, the price of bonds um, goes up. Um, and then when the price of bonds goes up, um, what's going to happen to the interest rate out there? Uh, what happens to the interest rate on bonds when the prices of bonds goes up? Yep, um, when the price of bonds goes up, right, the interest rate goes down. Um, they move inversely to each other. And the interest rate goes down, what happens to exports um, and to investment spending when the interest rate falls? Okay, so let's give you five more seconds. Uh, this is getting boring. Um, yep, and when the interest rate goes down, exports and investment spending both go up. Um, right. And when exports and investment spending goes up, what happens to real GDP? Uh, okay. And yep, real GDP goes up. That's the monetary transmission mechanism. The Federal Reserve does something to the demand and the amount of money and the amount of bonds in the system that shakes the prices of bonds and the interest rates on them, which in turn shakes the level of investment spending and exports, and which in turn changes the level of real GDP. Um, here's how the Federal Reserve does it. Um, here's the interest rate on three-month treasury bills in the secondary market. Um, that is, these aren't people buying and selling to the treasury. These are people buying and selling um, to each other. Um, the treasury only buys and sells treasury bond bills about once a month. Um, so if you want to figure out what the interest rate on treasury bills is for the other 29 days a month, you have to look at um, you have to look at the prices at which dealers and investment banks and commercial banks are selling treasury bills to each other. Um, these, and that gives you a daily series rather than just an every month auction series. Here's what's happened um, to the real interest rate on U.S. treasury bills. Um, oh God, since well, since um, my third year as an assistant professor, since 1990. Or so. um, in 1990, um, Alan Greenspan was chairman of the Federal Reserve, and Alan Greenspan and his Federal Reserve Open Market Committee had raised the interest rate on Treasury bills up to 8%. Um, they had done so because one October Monday in 1997, um, the stock market had crashed. Uh, the stock market had crashed by 25% on that one particular Monday for no good fundamental reason that anyone could explain. Economists like Myron Scholes and Robert Burton and Eugene Fama tried to claim it was because a U.S. Congressional Committee had taken a particular vote indicating that they were going to be less likely to be approving of future corporate takeovers. Um, but, you know, the Congress does such things once a week in terms of taking a committee vote that changes the odds of what the financial regulatory framework would be. And this was the only such thing in history that is associated with a 25% fall in the level of the stock market. Um, 
we think uh, we think that this crisis, that this particular stock market crash, was actually made up at the Haas School of Business uh, by Professor Emeritus Hain Leland, uh, together with his partners O'Brien and Rubenstein, because he had been evolving the first computer-driven trading systems, and he had offered to um, help money managers use computers to rapidly and quickly trade stocks in order to hedge risks and quickly get out of positions in whenever they thought that it might be very good to get out of a position because prices were going to move in some direction or other. And so what happened was that um, early on this Monday, Hain Leland's computers got a bunch of orders from financial managers saying they wanted to sell stocks. And so the computers dumped all their stocks onto the market. Um, and as those stocks dumped, were dumped onto the market, prices began to go down, which led other people to say, well, gee, we should sell as well, which then meant that all the people who were following computerized strategies through Leland O'Brien and Rubenstein, by which when prices went down, they would sell, started to sell as well, which meant that all the people who were following Leland O'Brien's competitors started to sell too. And then a whole bunch of people who simply saw stocks were going down for no reason they could think of said something bad is happening in the market and we need to sell as well. And by the end of the day, prices were down by 25%. Um, that night, uh, my grandfather and grandmother Lord came to dinner at our house, at my wife's and my house, and um, saw you know, the two of us in our kind of brand new little suburban house. Um, and he was rich then, and I think he had lost about a million and a half dollars that day. Uh, and he was also 73. Um, and his reaction was, well, it was an interesting day, uh, but nothing to worry about. I'm in the stock market for the long term. Values fluctuate. Um, I like these stocks on Friday, and I like the companies these stocks are in today uh, just as much. Uh, think of it this way. I now have an opportunity to buy more of stocks I like at 25% off. I'm going to be in there the following morning buying stocks. Uh, and he was. Um, and there's a lot to admire for that, um, especially since he was at 73 or so planning, thinking he still had a long-term time horizon. In fact, he did live until 95, uh, and actually could use practically every cent uh, that he made then, because old age is expensive. Uh, so Alan Greenspan had responded to this crash of the stock market by saying, oh my god, maybe a depression's coming, we need to cut interest rates to encourage investment spending and exports. And he had cut interest rates substantially in late 1997 and kept them low in 1998, or 1987 and 88. And then from the end of 1988, the Federal Reserve was saying we overdid it. We cut interest rates, and so we boosted investment spending and exports, but there's no depression coming. We shouldn't have done that. In fact, right now, there's too much spending in the economy, and so as a result, there's a lot of spending, chasing less production, and inflation's on the rise. And we really don't want people to get back into the frame of mind they got back in the 1970s, when they expect that every year inflation will be a little bit higher than it was the year before. We need to cool off the economy. We need to create a situation in which there actually is a little rise in unemployment, in which there's a little recession, in order to underscore to people that um, we want the Federal Reserve will not let inflation take hold in the American economy again. And so gradually in 1988 and 99, they pushed the unemployment rate, the inflation rate up to 8%, where they were holding it in early 1990 and scratching their heads and saying, why are all these businesses still borrowing to build factories when the short-term nominal interest rate is 8%? This doesn't make much sense to us. And they were thinking about raising it higher. And then lo and behold, in late 1990, the recession that they were predicting and that they, fact they had wanted came on. Um, a small recession. Um, and they said, oh, that's good. Now at least the market knows that we are in the business of permanently accommodating inflation. Now we can return interest rates to normal. Um, and so then they returned interest rates to normal gradually over the next two or three years, and then pushed them down from the then normal of 5% down to 3%, uh, saying that, well, there are these various long-term deficit reduction bills moving through the Congress, cutting back on federal spending. If you cut back on government purchases, that's going to put downward pressure on aggregate demand. Uh, we don't want a good fiscal policy over the long term that gets America's government finances back into order. We don't want such a good fiscal policy to be accompanied by a further rise in unemployment. So we're going to cut the government a break. We're going to cut President Clinton and his congressional coalition a break by pushing interest rates down below their normal level for them of 5% to 3%. In that way, we're going to get some more export spending. We're going to get some more business investment spending. It's a good way of rewarding politicians who are behaving uh, more or less, who are behaving more or less normally and righteously. And we're going to keep interest rates down at three percent as long as we can, which Greenspan did throughout 1993 and most of 1994 as the Clinton administration tried to move its deficit reduction packages through Congress. And we succeeded, and we are all still very grateful to Alan Greenspan for doing this, which we think was a wonderful thing for the country. And then, come the end of 1994, Greenspan says, "Okay, the economy is now well established. It's time to raise interest rates back to their normal levels." And they did, and they then kept them there between 1995 and 1998 or so as the dot-com boom got established. Um, and all the while, there were a bunch of people saying, wait a minute, the economy is overheating. Wait a minute, inflation's around the corner. Wait a minute, interest rates should be rising, raising interest rates some more. Um, Greenspan didn't. In fact, the next move of interest rates was down again during the Russian financial crisis of 1998, um, which led Alan Greenspan to interrupt a tennis vacation he was having in August to actually come to UC Berkeley and up at the Haas School announce this change in monetary policy, uh, which we all went to and he clapped. Um, and then the Russian financial crisis of 1998 quickly passed. Um, and then throughout 99, 2000, and into early 2001, the Federal Reserve gradually raised interest rates, thinking that the unemployment rate was now well below 4%, um, and that couldn't be sustainable forever, um, that the dot-com boom was turning into a bubble which then collapsed at the end of 2001. Uh, and the Federal Reserve lowered short-term interest rates rapidly in an attempt to keep this little recession here from becoming a big recession, saying, wait a minute, businesses are no longer investing like mad because they're over-optimistic because of the dot-com business. Uh, we need to lower interest rates to give businesses more of an incentive to invest as it is. Um, then comes September 11, 2001, um, this blank here when no treasury bills are traded. Uh, then they resume um, cutting interest rates and cutting interest rates further, worrying about the fact that economic growth in the early 2000s seemed to be anemic and thinking perhaps we should lower interest rates a little bit more in order to give businesses even more of an incentive to invest before in late 2004 starting on the process of raising interest rates back to normal levels again. And then they kept them at normal levels in 2007 until our current financial crisis started. During our current financial crisis, well, it's been somewhat confused. There have been episodes in which there's a big gap uh, between when no one's trading. But since the start of the current crisis, the Federal Reserve has, with one short interruption, dropped the short-term nominal interest rates it controls to within hailing distance of zero and kept them there. And right now, the betting is that the Federal Reserve is going to keep its short-term nominal interest rates near zero, at least through the end of 2011 and into 2000.